How do you define world-class? A world-class city. We were a very large Fortune 500 city, and it looked like we had unlimited growing potential here. A world-class airport. Because of the foresight of so many citizens and community leaders, we possess aviation facilities unsurpassed by any metropolitan area. A world-class town. You could pick out any house you want, as long as it's in Bridgeton. A world-class community. Everybody knew each other, neighbors were neighbors. Carrollton was a special place. But what do you get when you listen to politics and ego over truth and science? A world-class boondoggle. I am not going to jeopardize the economic future of this region for a few people. The city of Bridgeton has been sold out by the city of St. Louis. If you are to accomplish what you need to accomplish at Lambert, you have to go west. It was like a bulldozer to democracy. Not only were they going to take people's homes, they were going to shut people up. No, no. That billion dollar expansion plan will cut through the heart of Bridgeton. Bridgeton is going to do what is necessary to protect Bridgeton. They have no business destroying a good community. I'm really concerned that we'll end up with a white elephant. The W1W will not have St. Louis a world class airport. This allows Lambert to go in the 21st century. Anybody who objects to it, I think, has a head in the sand. Was it worth the billion dollars? Not this boondoggle. And it's all gone. And for what? For nothing. We're going to have to borrow this money. The city of somebody else is not going to eat this thing, and I don't think it'll be known as Greg's Folly. But now, what we have is a regional airport with a lot of debt. What makes Bridgeton worth saving? We invite you to come along with us on a poignant look at our community, to see a city that symbolizes and embodies the American dream, a city steeped in history with hopes and plans for the future. Bridgeton was founded in 1794, and its population hovered around 200 people between 1880 and 1950. But its population soared in the 1960s and 1970s, reaching nearly 8,000 by 1960 and nearly 20,000 by 1970. The surge in population can mostly be attributed to the creation of the Carrollton subdivisions in 1956. My name is Conrad Byers. I lived in Bridgeton uh, since 1964. We're actually in our third house. Our first house was in the Carrollton subdivision. And when family grew, we uh, moved outside uh, to a house that we thought we'd be there forever, 11945 Gifts Road. Well, Carrollton was one of the first areas, one of the first self-developer, self-contained communities. I mean, it had churches, schools, uh, shopping center. Uh, it even had a club for the residents. So it was uh, sort of a self-contained community. In fact, received national recognition at that time. Carrollton's 1,800 homes by far had the most people of any other subdivision in all of Bridgeton. The existence of Carrollton presented a new and appealing opportunity for middle-class families in the 1960s and 1970s. My name is Charles Sapp. Uh, I lived at 4056 Gladwin in Bridgeton. To give you an idea of what Carrollton like, Carrollton had so much interest going in it that you actually had to campaign to be on the board of directors. People had so much interest they actually went out and recruited. My name is Jack Taylor. Bought my first home in 1977 at 12652 Selburn. Carrollton was a, a vibrant, fun, uh, great place to, to raise a family. Uh, everybody knew each other, neighbors were neighbors. Carrollton was a special place. We had baseball teams, we had four swimming pools at the community center. Being a family community, I mean, we knew people through the schools and all the kids. And so when you were there for 20 years, going to the grocery store was kind of a major outing because you spent so much time talking to your friends and neighbors that uh, it took more time than shopping for groceries. My name is Jamie Desi Shonaweiss. My address was 12636 Brumley Drive. And when we moved to Carrollton, it felt normal. It really kind of felt like it was its own sort of nestled community. My name is Maggie Taylor. When I was eight years old, we moved to 12748 Marburn Lane. We absolutely loved that community. I got my first job at Carrollton Pool. That pool was the hub of my summers. We never had to leave there. There was something to do all the time. 1,800 homes, a great community. 
a most unusual neighborhood. And Bridgeton itself is much like that. I mean, you'll find that Bridgeton was a family type community. People cared about what happened to you and what happened to your neighbors. Bridgeton continued to thrive, and many Carrollton residents worked nearby for McDonnell Douglas, Transworld Airlines, or in some other form at St. Louis Lambert International Airport. Carrollton residents helped transform Lambert into a world-class airport. Because of the foresight of so many citizens and community leaders, we possess aviation facilities unsurpassed by any metropolitan area. While the Carrollton community in Bridgeton opened in 1956, Lambert Airport had their own grand opening in the same year with the debut of Terminal 1. At the time, it was a world-class terminal and set the tone for many modern airline terminals to come. All of these men and women have worked toward a common goal, that of giving St. Louis the most modern air facilities in the world. Lambert continued to be trailblazers through the jet and space age, and residents of the Carrollton subdivision had a hand in putting St. Louis on the cutting edge of the aviation industry. We had tremendous uh, experience in the aviation business because so many people that lived in Carrollton worked for McDonnell Douglas. I mean, we had people who had created and engineered the Mercury spacecraft, Apollo, Gemini, the F-14. I think we had more aviation expertise and aviation engineering expertise than anybody in Washington, D.C. Lambert's growth was astronomical, with the annual number of passengers increasing from a half million in 1950 to nearly six million in 1972. Lambert needed to expand, but was now landlocked after missing an opportunity to buy surrounding unoccupied land in the 1950s in anticipation of further expansion. Lambert was not unusual in being landlocked. It was actually probably more, more typical. When it was first built, look at the old pictures, it was farmland. Uh, and now it is in the middle of the city. So there was a push to come up with a less expensive and less disruptive alternative to expanding Lambert, and that was to build a new airport. The idea gained steam in the 1970s to build a regional airport in the Columbia and Waterloo area of Illinois. If you look back at Lambert expansion, they were talking about the need for growth back in 76 when Columbia Waterloo came up, and that was a proposal. And it was actually being considered by the FAA. And then it was delayed, and not more than a year later, we got a new transportation secretary and the funding was cut. And the reason it was probably cut was it didn't focus on the city of St. Louis and Lambert and the region. And I think that's the trouble with our, our leaders in the region. They're too focused on serving themselves and rather than serving the region. There have been lots of studies, lots of discussion about building another airport. That faced a lot of political opposition because it's not in Missouri. It's in, it's in Illinois, and, and, and therefore the, uh, the leadership recognized that putting an airport over there would be a bad idea. I think some of that provincialism uh, hurt St. Louis. Lambert was essentially saved, and the airport would rebuild and expand its runway shortly after that decision. But after airline deregulation in 1978, most airlines adopted a hub-and-spoke model. Ultimately, TWA chose St. Louis as its major domestic hub in 1982. The major carriers decided that, what we call hub airports, that you would have spoke cities and then you would funnel your passengers into that hub airport. It was a, a great way for an airline to connect its passengers from small communities to large communities and international destinations. The problem or the downside with a, a hub and spoke operation is that once one airline dominates the traffic in that community, the community kind of becomes beholden to that particular airline. And so you kind of go all in in current you know, parlance. We're all in for our hometown airline. The drums would beat again for airport expansion as TWA invested more in its hub in St. Louis throughout the 1980s. But in addition to being landlocked, there was another wrinkle with expanding Lambert. The city of St. Louis owned the airport, even though Lambert is located in St. Louis County, meaning a county municipality would be affected no matter which direction the city wanted to expand Lambert. Known as the Great Divorce, the city of St. Louis split from St. Louis County in 1877. There's a long history of tension between the city of St. Louis and the municipalities of St. Louis County. Some of that goes back literally 100 years. And the city of St. Louis did what the city of St. Louis wanted to do. And uh, the, it, it didn't really historically pay a lot of attention to what the, the smaller municipalities in the county wanted or didn't want. But the city and county were in much different positions a century later after the split. St. Louis County more than doubled its population over a 20-year span between 1950 and 1970. St. Louis City's population plummeted, 
from more than 850,000 in 1950 to less than 400,000 by 1990. We were a very large Fortune 500 city and it looked like we had unlimited growing potential here. But the key thing was, this was everything was changing in terms of industry, consumer patterns, uh, growth in population, mergers and acquisitions. All these things were changing and changing very rapidly. What you had to do was to pay attention to what was happening to the city itself. With times changing and the city of St. Louis rapidly losing its tax base, Lambert was arguably the most important revenue producer left for the city. And with local leaders passing on building a brand new airport for the region, it was now Lambert or bust for a world-class airport in St. Louis, leading to an inevitable collision course more than a century in the making. The concept of home rule was so much part of the political atmosphere, the political dynamic in St. Louis County. There's a reason why St. Louis County has so many jurisdictions. People feel very loyal to their town. Uh, so a lot of this was, was really uh, historically set up for a long time that there was going to be a battle if the city of St. Louis ever wanted to go past its boundary. The airport is landlocked. That is, it's surrounded by cities. To expand means to invade one of them. You can't build a world-class airport with something that's landlocked like Lambert. You can't attack this job with the idea of keeping everybody happy all the time. You have to make decisions and you have to live with the consequences. The man who ultimately became the face of Lambert's attempt to maintain its world-class status was former mayor of St. Louis, Vince Shamel. Shamel became the mayor in 1981 and was in office during Lambert's ascent following the impact of deregulation. In the late 1980s, Lambert's annual passenger traffic exceeded 20 million and was ranked in the top 10 busiest airports nationwide, prompting this call to action from Shamel. Lambert is the lifeblood of this uh, city's and region's economy. Uh, and we have got to get on with the business of expanding it. And with that began the first of many editorials in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch over the next several years, touting the expansion of Lambert. And it came from the mayor himself on June 25th, 1989. Shamel's piece stoked fear that the St. Louis region's economic outlook was in doubt unless Lambert expanded. Shamel foreshadowed what would come later that summer when he said, Air traffic future must be governed by the needs of the entire St. Louis region of 2.5 million people and not by the preferences of individuals in the path of the airport's expansion. I am not going to jeopardize the economic future of this region for a few people. And on the evening of Friday, August 25th, 1989, everything changed forever in Bridgeton. Well, there is shock and anger in Bridgeton tonight among residents who now find their homes in the path of airport expansion. Jennifer, officials have narrowed down their choices for airport expansion to four plans. What the people of Bridgeton don't like is that all of them run through their city. We had no indication. We were stunned. We read about it in the paper. And there was the Post-Dispatch on the driveway, and I opened it up, and right in the middle of the front page was a big color photo with a map saying airport is, exp is expanding. We're coming right through Bridgeton. Realistically, that runway was coming right through my living room. The city of Bridgeton has been sold out by the city of St. Louis. We have no input whatsoever and no representation. And I personally was very surprised because just three years prior to that, Leonard Griggs, Colonel Griggs, was the director and he actually addressed city council. I was on city council at the time and he wrote a letter. I have the letter. But Lambert would never expand west. They would never expand the airport west of Lindbergh. The Carrollton Oak subdivision is the neighborhood Bridgeton officials believe to be most at risk from the airport expansion plan. Bridgeton officials believe eventually the whole 1800 home neighborhood might be gone. I would not consider Bridgeton or any of the neighbors to be obstructionists. We recognize the value of airport expansion and the need for it in the region. We always look to a plan that would uh, reduce delays, increased activity at the airport, but not at tremendous expense on the environment. It's not the idea they claim, it's the way Mayor Vincent Shamel and other politicians are trying to bulldoze their way across the Bridgeton community. The airport promised all along that the airport neighbors would be involved in this process and we were not involved. We were left out and we uh, personally hold Vincent Shamel responsible. Shamel's uh, strategy oftentimes on issues were we're the city of St. Louis, we have a right to do what we want to do and we're just going to move full speed ahead to do that. That emanated from the fact that the city owns the airport and the land, but it's located in St. Louis County. And for that reason, the city, I think, took the attitude that 
These people don't vote for us. They don't pay any taxes to us. They told us, here's what we're going to do. Get out of the way. The city of St. Louis paid consulting firm Landerman Brown to analyze 27 possible plans to prepare Lambert for the 21st century. The firm whittled that down to four alternatives, with all four cutting through Bridgeton. But the airport commission would have to ultimately accept the final recommendation of the consultants, and that approval was a foregone conclusion. We look at the airport commission at that time consisted of 10 members. Four of them were elected officials from the city of St. Louis. Uh, one was a director and there were five appointed by the mayor. So the airport commission, really just an extension of the mayor's office. We are just absolutely shocked by the tyranny in this particular situation where one person, the mayor of the city of St. Louis, controls the whole process. The city of St. Louis is dictating to the county the expansion plans that they feel is, is required. They're dictating those to the county. There's no representation there. That is a major problem. The county has never had any representation on a city-owned and operated airport in the, in the county. The city would increase the number of seats on the airport commission to 15, and for the first time ever, gave seats to St. Louis County. But the city still made sure they held all the cards. We really need regional representation. This is not it. It's only a start, because the way it stands now, we'll have five members. There'll be 10 from the city of St. Louis. And if it's going to be a regional vote, losing 10 to 5 is the same as losing 10 or 9 to nothing. Bridgeton knew it was going to be impacted. It was just a matter of which plane was chosen and when it would be announced. So Carrollton residents were caught in a state of limbo and wanted answers. The more we asked for cooperation, the less response we got. And the answer wouldn't come until October 12th, 1989. Good evening. A billion dollar plan for expanding Lambert Airport has been accepted. And the spark that ignited this controversy is dubbed the F4 proposal. Two new runways would be built near the existing runways, but a third runway, more than a mile and a half long, would extend northwest into Bridgeton. And if you think that we are going to sit by and watch a runway like an alley through these residential areas and not object in the strongest possible way, you're wrong. The people that got affected the most immediately was the real estate market. Those who had their homes on, or were going to sell their homes, or already had them on sale, that was dead. It killed the real estate market in Carrollton. We cannot be the community we want to be if we don't have an airport that can service our needs in the 21st century. St. Louis needs something approaching a silk purse, and Mayor Shamel is proposing to deliver to the people of that metropolitan area a sow's ear. It won't work. F4 had a price tag of more than a billion dollars and also would have wiped out nearly a thousand homes in Bridgeton. And concerns about F4's viability came from the people who worked at Lambert every day, the pilots and air traffic controllers. The pilots, we looked at that as just being a, a hugely hazardous operation. Uh, anytime you mix the airplanes and construction equipment on an airfield, it requires a lot of caution, slows everything down. It was just an unworkable solution. I'm an air traffic controller by trade. Um, and was working at Lambert at the time. The F-4 proposal was so sort of bizarre uh, and so absolutely ridiculous that it, it, as presented, it didn't make sense. I went to the interviews at the airport, to the presentations, and honestly, the things they said they were going to do was not legal by our current rules and standards. In fact, they're not legal today. But they said, well, we'll change the rules as we have to and all that. It just didn't make any sense. I th thought it was dead upon arrival. The F-4 plan was like having root canals at work done while you're having dinner. It was trying to build an airport on top of an existing operating airport. Bridgeton received minimal political support outside their city, but did find an ally in their congressman from Missouri's 2nd Congressional District, Jack Beekner. It is improper, and I believe it is unconstitutional, to have a city airport run by city people deciding the fate of county taxpayers. A lot of these estimates are based upon a uh, geometric increase of passengers, which uh, includes in it what happened during uh, the uh, deregulation. I don't think you're going to see that same kind of a hump occur again. Despite the concerns and questions raised from Bridgeton residents on all these factors regarding the F-4 proposal, they still felt the city of St. Louis wasn't listening or communicating. So the Carrollton neighborhood got the attention of Shamel and the city of St. Louis. Bridgeton residents are out tonight protesting plans to expand Lambert Airport into their community. Tonight, a huge bonfire brought together hundreds in the community. St. Louis Mayor Vince Shamel was burned in effigy tonight. We strongly feel that it's a great place to live and we hate to see someone that's not involved 
from the city come out and try to take away what we've built over the years. This bonfire tonight may signal the start of a new and more active opposition. After the announcement of F4 and the Carrollton bonfire, Shamel told the Post-Dispatch that expansion has to happen and added more fuel to the fire saying, I think they've effectively killed the real estate market of Bridgeton by their reaction. The airport expansion has a small impact on Bridgeton proper, but by elevating the debate to such a level, they have tarred all of Bridgeton. That's ridiculous. We're reacting to an announcement that they made. That announcement has really impacted real estate and try to pass that on to anyone else is ridiculous. People with any common sense will not buy that. While Vince Shamel was crowned the champion for the airport and business community to expand Lambert, he became the villain for Bridgeton. He asked to have lunch with me, and so I went. And I said, Vince, if you do one thing for the future, I said, go out there with a committee and talk to Bowers and tell those people what's going on and what, you, what we intend to do, and he wouldn't do it. And he basically said, I don't have to. And I said, okay, these people, you don't, you don't understand what these people can do. And that was it. There was no more communication. And that's what started it. That announcement gave birth to the Bridgeton Air Defense, a grassroots efforts by residents to block the expansion and save their homes. The final goal for us was to ensure that our property and our families were protected and that everybody got a fair market value for their property. And so we put together an organization of the people and went to work. Basically, we're doing with, dealing with a bunch of people that they're gonna plow ahead, do their own plan, and not listen to reason or not even do it from a, an honest engineering perspective. Bridgeton Air Defense served a uh, tremendous value to the community. They pulled together a lot of people that understood airline operations, and they were able to provide that information to the public in a ways that the Bridgeton and the City Council could not and really get the citizenry involved in the airport activities. I think they're nothing short of brilliant. And they did an extraordinary job in part because the leaders recognized that this was an advertising campaign. This was a campaign to win the hearts and minds, not just of Bridgeton, not just of St. Louis, but really of the entire community. I was in the public relations business. I, that was my career, my whole uh, professional life. So we had a lot of expertise in a lot of areas. They launched a number of me uh, measures that in the political realm caused a lot of people to scratch their heads. We don't do these sort of things in the political realm. You know, they had bumper stickers, uh, the Shame Old Happens bumper sticker. They had protests in front of Shame Old's house uh, where they would park their cars on a Sunday morning and play cassette tapes of jet noise. Um, in their cars, with their windows open, by the way. They, they, they employed all of the good, what I would call sort of guerrilla warfare political techniques that today are viewed much more commonly. There's no doubt that the folks in Bridgeton have launched a very savvy PR campaign against Lambert expansion. These yellow ribbons are just one part of it, but they say by far the most successful part is something called the bad hotline. This is your 24-hour St. Louis County Bridgeton Air Defense Hotline report, day 25, Bridgeton held hostage. From today's vantage point, the bad hotline seems kind of hokey, um, but before social media, before people had ways of really communicating in real time about events, uh, Bridgeton Air Defense set up a hotline uh, that people could call to get the latest information, to pass information back and forth. Mayor Bowers says the bad hotline isn't meant to be malicious, but since they've instituted something called the shame old joke of the day, response has gone from hundreds to over a thousand. And now the shame old joke of the day. The devil recently approached shame and told him, Vince, we can make this entire airport fiasco go away. The only thing is, you've got to assign your soul to me for all eternity. To which Vince replied, so what's the catch? All because a few people have just let their lives be taken over by hatred. Uh, I really feel sorry for these people. They're sick. The bad hotline had a lot of pretty, uh, what do I want to say, loose uh, uh, publicity. Uh, they had a lot of things that today would be considered to be fake news uh, and uh, did a very good job of it. In the meantime, Vince, we'll see you down the road, but remember, hardball season hasn't really started yet. Have a bad day. I think it exposes the bridge and air defense for what they are, and that is a group of just hate-filled people who have let this whole issue take over their lives. and. Frankly, I feel very sorry for him. That probably was his interpretation only, coming from his own selfish ego, quite honestly. 
because we were doing a lot of lot of good for a lot of people, doing a, communicating a, a very serious issue, and communicating the fact that we had to work very hard to be treated fairly. Part of their success was they didn't feel themselves bound by the traditional rules of politics, the traditional rules of law. And that was so unusual that the political leadership didn't know what to do about them because they couldn't use the traditional political tools to attack them back the way you might if it, if it were a mayor versus mayor kind of battle. Mayor, a couple of years ago, the Wall Street Journal in a very glowing article on St. Louis called you the king of St. Louis. Why would the king of St. Louis want to become governor of the state of Missouri. Vince Shamel was in his third term and had just celebrated his 10th anniversary as the mayor of St. Louis and was looking to take the next step up in his political career and had his eyes on the Missouri governor's mansion. So Bridgeton Air Defense slightly altered their strategy from a community grassroots organization to a political action committee and set its sights on Shamel. We had to get to let people know that Vince Shamel did not deserve to be governor and that he would treat people in outstate Missouri the same way he treated us. That was the message. BAD took its message across the state, traveling to places like Bowling Green and Independence and many more towns and counties in between. There were Democratic Club events in some small towns where we had the ability, we could literature the entire town. Every house, every business, everything, because we had enough people. I think we're making a very adverse dent and I think we're being very successful. Uh, we have to educate outstate Missourians uh, about what's been going on here in St. Louis. I think that uh, some of those people are very sincere in the attitudes that they hold and frankly I think some of those people are simply uh, political operatives uh, working on behalf of some of my political enemies. We never went out and campaigned for a politician. We did not directly tell people to vote for Mel Carnahan. We told people not to vote for Vince Shamel. On August 4th, 1992, Mel Carnahan easily defeated Vince Shamel in the Missouri governor Democratic primary. Shamel only mustered 33% of the statewide vote, and the media proclaimed King of St. Louis even lost to Carnahan in his own city by 16 percentage points. And it really worked because it was people talking to people. There were no politicians between us. The FAA threw out the F-4 proposal in 1994. It kind of, uh died of its own weight, this idea of trying to build this new airport on top of an existing airport. A lot of people eventually saw that this would not work. With F4 dead and Vince Shamel losing the governor's race and not running for a fourth term as mayor of St. Louis, it appeared Bridgeton had won the battle. However, a new political regime stepped in, ready to pick up where Vince Shamel left off, meaning the war for Lambert expansion was far from over. Bridgeton was fighting a 20th, 20th century political machine. We knew that uh, it wasn't going to be as simple as killing one of the proposals. The business community's pressure to expand the airport was so strong that they weren't going to stop. And the message was pretty clear. We have a boundary of the city of St. Louis. We're not going to affect St. Louis. We're not going to affect Berkeley. We are going to affect Bridgeton. That billion dollar expansion plan will cut through the heart of Bridgeton. It was like a bulldozer to democracy. I'm really concerned that we'll end up with a white elephant. W1W will not have St. Louis a world class airport. We are fighting for more than our homes and our city. We are fighting for the American dream, the right to work hard, to buy one's own home, to be able to protect that home from unjust and unfair confiscation. We, the citizens of Bridgeton, ask you please to come to our city and help us tell our story, the story of a community fighting the battle of a lifetime against tremendous odds. The F-4 airport expansion proposal cutting into Bridgeton was gone, but Carrollton wasn't the same. Demolition of homes is underway in the Carrollton area. It's part of the ongoing noise abatement program. They want to stay, but as homes come down, so do their property values. 
and many wonder how long they can hold out. Lambert Airport bought out some 229 homes in a subdivision, then demolished them, leaving gaps of empty land where the houses once stood. In serving on the airport commission and seeing how the airport actually handled buyouts, even for just noise, was pathetic. The airport would buy properties when they felt it suited them. There are some people in Bridgeton who say if they don't sell, they'll be forced out anyway because of what they call blockbusting. You would have house, house, flat land, house, house, flat, nothing, or even a vacant house um, be sitting. So the idea of blockbusting is this theory that the airport would buy, purchase a house and for the sole purpose of vacating it, letting it sit abandoned and kind of making a, making a show to everybody else that is around, uh, that we are going to buy this area, um, your time here is limited. It did create fear, you know, for those that were left behind. Conrad Bowers had just finished his eighth year as mayor of Bridgeton, getting his city through the F4 expansion plan. But the fact that the city of St. Louis was still able to take homes in his city with no firm expansion plan in place led him to a revelation. You know, in 1995, I decided to run for mayor again because I realized that we're looking at all this property that was purchased for the F4 plan under the guise of noise abatement, and there's gonna be real problems. And so I decided to run. And, and not only that, to stay, because at that time we could have moved anywhere. We could have moved, but no, Bridgeton is home. We're gonna stay. Conrad is, I mean, he's a boy scout. He's, he, he, he's, he's very principled. And he wasn't going to give up because the political power told him that wasn't what he should be doing. And he also recognized very practically, he looked at the amount of real estate that was going to be taken by any expansion. And he recognized that his city would cease to exist as an entity if St. Louis achieved what it wanted to achieve. Study after study after study has shown that if you are to accomplish what you need to accomplish at Lambert, you have to go west. And on July 6th, 1995, it would happen again to Bridgeton. Lambert Airport officials have picked the airport expansion plan known as W1W. This alternative gives us the increased capacity to meet the aviation needs for the St. Louis region well into the 21st century. That billion dollar expansion plan will cut through the heart of Bridgeton. Though we know your sacrifice will be great, it is in the best interest of the region that we move forward. Bridgeton is going to do what is necessary to protect Bridgeton. W1W had an original price tag of $2.6 billion, which included a new runway nearly two miles long going west into Bridgeton, plus the extension of runway 12 right, and eventually the construction of a new terminal. The plan as presented will never happen, and W1W even enhanced cannot happen because of the additional cost. The proposed new runway again would decimate the city of Bridgeton, including the entire Carrollton neighborhood. You have an antiquated airport that they're wanting to spend another $2 billion on and destroy a third of our city, and we just don't think it's worthwhile to do that. W1W, that as we learn more about it, would destroy more than 2,000 homes, dislocate 6,000 people, uh, six churches, two of those with schools, 75 businesses. Uh, when we heard that, we thought, this is insane. Bridgeton is not against meaningful airport expansion. W1W is not good for the metropolitan area. So a new fight would begin between Bridgeton and the city of St. Louis with similar themes as the F4 fight, but new faces for Lambert expansion emerged with W1W. Freeman Bosley Jr. was now the mayor of St. Louis, and his successor, Clarence Harmon, continued the push for expansion. But the number one soldier for W1W was the man who told Bridgeton just nine years earlier that the airport would not expand westward, Colonel Leonard Griggs, who after being fired by Vince Shamel in 1987 as airport director, was brought back on by Bosley. Griggs would, if he's standing here, I'd tell him, and he'd, he'd curse me and I'd curse him a little bit back, it'd be all right. Um, he, he, he was more uh, in your face and more gruff. I'm not answering a hypothetical question. No, it's not hypothetical, it's in writing. I have no comment. Why is that? I guess I have no comment. Why? Because I have no comment. If we don't build this runway, we will be a major city stuck on the Mississippi River that again is going to go into decline. Leonard did not like to be challenged. He was a retired colonel. And nobody was supposed to question his decisions. What he said was the way to go. Being an engineer, being community minded, I didn't accept that. And Leonard didn't like that. So <laughs> Bridgeton found political support again from their congressman from the 2nd Congressional District. This time, it was Jim Talent, 
I'm really concerned that we'll end up with uh, with a white elephant. That the plan was at best a marginal improvement and at worst a potential white elephant for the area, and that would be a disaster. They picked the one course of action that, to me, was just not justifiable. It was incoherent. The community fight against Lambert from Bridgeton would evolve as well. Bridgeton Air Defense still played a role, but not with the same firepower. So somebody new would have to step up to help the fight against Lambert expansion into Bridgeton. I'm Sarah Barwinski, and I lived at 4410 Fifi Road. Sarah Barwinski was facing her second buyout in just a few years. Her husband, Dan, was pastor of Shepherd of the Hills Church. The church moved from the Carrollton neighborhood next to Bridgeton City Hall on Natural Bridge Road in 1993 after the airport bought them out for noise abatement. The Barwinski's home and church were now both in the buyout path of W1W, and their sentiment against the city of St. Louis and Lambert rang the same tune as those who opposed the F4 plan. It was just maddening that, um, that in, in a supposed democracy, someone that I don't even vote for, who won't return our phone calls, who just write us off, would have the power to take our homes, taxation without representation, what condemnation without representation is far worse. We know it's too expensive. We know that it's technically flawed. We know that we will fight it till the end. No representation for Bridgeton. It was like a bulldozer to democracy. Not only were they going to take people's homes, they were gonna shut people up. Sarah Barwinski launched People Building Community shortly after the W1W announcement. And she described it as a coalition of community grassroots groups working together which included Bridgeton Air Defense and St. Charles Citizens Against Aircraft Noise. The Barwinskis are ready to take up the cause and wanted to get the facts and better educated on why this was a flawed plan. And is it really for the common good? If it truly is going to serve the region, I'll take my money and run. But if it's a bad plan, they have no business destroying a good community. Because I've always said and said throughout the process that if in fact they could show me that this was the best plan for the region, that we would cease and desist, but they could never do that. Two groups who argued the technical flaws of the plan were the Airline Pilots Association and the National Association of Air Traffic Controllers. The ideal design of an airfield would have parallel runways so you can have independent and simultaneous operations. The runway configuration under proposed W1W would exist nowhere else in the world. The staggered runway that we have jutting into Bridgeton as as useful as an arm hanging out of your head the fact that the, the runways are staggered uh, had the effect of increasing taxi times greatly. The, co the money it costs to run, run, run an airplane when it's not flying, whether it's just sitting stable on the ground or it's spending, spending time taxiing, it's just is wasted money. They knew so little about air traffic. They were, like, they were like graphics people that put a runway down on a piece of paper and said, this will look cool. We were still going to be stuck with this antiquated uh, procedures that we were using at the time. W1W just didn't. It just added more, more complexity to a very complex airport already. I went to the air traffic controllers and I showed them the configuration early in this. And one of the guys says to me, he says, well, look, why don't you just, he starts laughing. He says, why don't you just build the runways end to end like this? And I said to him, well, look, can this be operated safely? He says, oh, we'll operate it safely. He says, you just won't get any additional capacity. And capacity was one of the many points of contention throughout this fight. Lambert was serving more than 25 million passengers and handling more than a half a million aircraft operations in the mid to late 1990s. We project that we need to develop an airport, if all things continue and all things being equal, and the FAA I think will back us on this, that we need to put together an airport that will be able to handle 632,000 takeoffs and landings and 40 million people in the year 2015. We can't do that with the airport the present size. Flying point to point uh, was starting to dilute the, the, the need to have a hub and spoke system. So that trend was already started. The projection numbers that they had, both for, for passenger projections and the number of airplane operations, which was what we were rather really concerned about, the number of airplanes can come and go out of St. Louis, uh, those projections we thought were really rosy. The idea that, that they needed to spend all that money based on those numbers, was really uh, not on very solid ground. Some of the claims are, are exaggerated. And some of the claims of the existing airport capacity are understated. But the difference provides the 
the advantage, the, the operational efficiency, the improvement that's needed here, and it's just not provided by WNW. The business community in the St. Louis region was firmly behind expansion, and they forecasted billions of dollars in additional revenue from Greg's preferred expansion plan. I think the bottom line is, years ago the decision was made to keep Lambert where it is. This airport is worth $4.5 billion to this economy. That $4.5 billion that we can expand this airport is going to be worth something in the neighborhood of 10 to $15 million in the year 2010. Is this something you want to give away? Is this something that you want to fly to the state of Missouri? I don't think so. One thing we know about forecasts is they're always wrong. I think that that's the reality because we can't account for all the things that are going to change along the way. If Leonard Griggs wanted to meet his aviation and economic projections, he would need a configuration with runways that could operate simultaneously in bad weather. Lambert couldn't do that because its parallel runways were only 1,300 feet apart and needed more space in between the runways to operate simultaneously in bad weather. It's fine when the sun is shining, but when the sun does not shine and you get down to where you can't see your shoes, you're down to one runway. And that cuts it dramatically down with this airport can produce. So having said all of that, W1W was the best alternative. It didn't make it better. It, it made it to some extent more complicated in bad weather. This whole design of this airport was always to increase operations in bad weather. So anything we, we, we got, we needed to have air, uh, runways separated far enough apart um, and thresholds close enough apart that we could run simultaneous operations. Uh, this layout didn't do any of that. When the weather conditions start to, to deteriorate slightly and you go into instrument flight rules, the capacity of a W1W configured Lambert will be no better essentially than what we have today, after $2.6 billion. W1W will not give St. Louis a world-class airport. Don Jacobs says analysis of W1W by the airline pilots reveals a plan that may not dramatically improve capacity or delays and will not give Lambert officials what they want most to land two planes at the same time in bad weather. The runways are still uh, too closely spaced for uh, simultaneous independent approaches in all weather conditions. In mail outs, airport director Leonard Griggs has dismissed the pilot's concerns. So Jacob sent a letter to Griggs saying W1W quote, will not produce a peak efficiency, could be a hoax on the community and a white elephant. The justification they gave for it was that we would be able to, la to, to land simultaneously, operate simultaneously in really bad weather. But everybody who, who knew airports, who was not connected with the airport itself, was telling me, no, because of the stagger of the runway, you can't operate simultaneously. So the reason they gave for it was not something that the plan would deliver. You know, bullshit overcomes science occasionally, and there's always a cost to that. And the financial cost, of course, was in the billions of dollars. And the city of St. Louis was assuming the brunt of the risk in this expansion project. Everyone agrees that if the new runway were placed next to the two existing ones, there would be no problem. But W1W will be built 12,400 feet farther west because airport officials say that is where it makes the most economic sense. All the expenses will come from airport revenue, and that means uh, money, profits from parking, from concession sales, landing fees, and surcharges on tickets. I mean, I would tell people um, in the press and at meetings, I would say, look, the federal government's not paying for this. Okay, this is not federal money that we can just afford to waste and it won't affect the region. We're gonna have to borrow this money. And if we don't get the capacity, we're blowing the, the remaining credit of the airport and digging ourselves into a huge hole. We are stunned, we're surprised because there's so many better alternatives. W1W is a disaster. There were many proposals about which direction to take Lambert expansion. And based on the airport's own study, one alternative was better operationally. The pilots preferred expanding south, also known as the S1 plan. Well, the S1 would have provided runway separation because you really need an airplane to the airport that's wide, not long. And that would accomplish that horrible cost. But operationally, that would have made it been the airport. And the terminal would have been the right place, too. So that would have been a superior plan from an operational standpoint. According to the study, S1 would have wiped out at least 1,000 more homes than W1W across multiple municipalities and would cost at least $300 million more. Airport officials tell us the West 1W plan was selected because it requires the least amount of land acquisition and it costs less than other plans. But looking at it from a cost-benefit standpoint from Lambert's own research numbers, adding a runway to the Northeast, known as the NE1A alternative, was by far the superior plan. 
I would like to see the runway built on the north side of the airport. In fact, almost totally on airport property. That will do everything that W1W will do for just a fraction of the cost. You know, this was the result of a several year planning process. And through most of that planning process, they were, they were leaning towards the NE1A plan and would have given them substantial capacity. Then at the last minute, they changed to W1W. Suppose I'd have taken what we called NE1A. In five to 10 years, we'll have to come back because we still cannot handle the forecast instrument traffic. We feel that W1W allows Lambert to go in the 21st century. We can quote you on that. <laughs> it will take us in the 21st century. Yes, you may. This is a very big plan that costs an awful lot of money, that's very disruptive. And we just went through that with F4 and ended up with an unworkable and unaffordable plan. And what I'm saying is we know we can add an additional runway at less cost, at less disruption, and then leave the way open for further expansion if we needed it. Well, I go west through Bridgeton when you could come east here through Kinlock. As you can see, much of Kinlock has already been bought out. More of it will be. But airport officials say coming east does not give them enough room to space the runways the way they want to. Today, the FAA demands that you must have 3,400 feet centerline to centerline between two runways to be able to land in bad weather. W1W will allow us to have the land and give us a separation distance between the runways. The FAA announced they would only conduct an environmental impact study on W1W and S1, leaving NE1A out because it only had 2,500 feet of runway separation. What became pretty clear was that it was a plan in search of a rationale. Yeah, it stuck in my craw. I mean, I both because of what it would do to my constituents, but also because we were going to spend all this money borrowing it all and not get capacity so it would cripple the airport going forward. And I just, I can't repeat enough, their own justification for this, that they'd be able to have simultaneous operations in really bad weather, which is only like five or six percent of the time, by the way, okay? Uh, and they can't. The Air Traffic Controllers Association also preferred the NE1A plan, but why did Lambert pull the plug on NE1A in favor of W1W? One reason was the city wanted federal dollars to help fund the multi-billion dollar project, but couldn't get help from the feds if they expanded north or east. St. Louis officials are meeting in Washington this afternoon, trying to get federal funds for Lambert Airport expansion. Officials say they'd like to get as much as 200 million from the government. President Clinton issued the executive order on environmental justice. You cannot impact communities that are of a lower income status using federal funds that would be detrimental. The political structure in this part of the county was really stacked against Bridgeton, whether it be the congressional districts uh, and, and, and all the effort that St. Louis had gone to to make sure the districts included the, the leadership of the, of the city and the leadership of the county. But politically, Bridgeton did not have a lot of power. And it was fighting a 20th, 20th century political machine. But that's not how you know, airport planning should be done. It shouldn't be politics. It should be, you know, what, what is, what's, what's safety, what's capacity, what, what can we deliver for the best cost. Sarah and Dan Barwinski continue to learn and also educate others through people building community about all the technical and financial flaws of the W1W plan and found allies not just in Bridgeton and St. Charles, but in the entire region as well. I think for the region as a whole, and this is a problem with as carved up as St. Louis area is in different pieces, they might not even be able to tell you where Bridgeton or Cool Valley or you know is on a map. They just know it's not their <laughs> their community. You know, I think there is a philosophy of divide and conquer in terms of groups, and we saw it at play people trying to divide Bridgeton with each other. And so then the other philosophy is that we're better together. And what I found when I worked with people with Cool Valley and Kinlock was actually a lot of solidarity because they knew what we had gone through. The Barwinskis and People Building Community would also forge a relationship with Tom Brown and the Pilots Association, and they complemented each other's message on why W1W wasn't the right plan for Lambert in the region. Operating airplanes is pretty scientific. When you disregard that science in, in favor of something squishy like, I want a world-class airport, in favor of what you think are going to be political gains. Uh, and especially when the politicians can make decisions that they're never held accountable for. People in Bridgeton were more than willing to throw themselves under the bus if it was going to accomplish something. But the idea that it wasn't going to accomplish something, and they knew it and we knew it, uh, that was especially painful to watch. The first time I met Tom, 
he <clears throat> was in his uniform and he was doing all of his things. Oh, this is Sarah Barwinski, you know. And uh, he said, well, I need you to, you to know this isn't about saving your home. He, unlike his predecessors, was not afraid to speak very loudly the truth to power. W1W would continue to pass major hurdles, including winning environmental approval from the FAA in December 1997. A favorable record of decision seemed imminent in 1998, but the Airline Pilots Association questioned the FAA's study and continued their arguments that the W1W expansion plan would not make Lambert a world-class airport. The pilot union claims the FAA study numbers are flawed, of questioning the figures used to justify the new runway in Bridgeton. Our concern is that for a massive capital investment, W1W may be just a very incremental improvement as opposed to a, a major improvement. You spend $2.6 billion or $3 billion or whatever the price finally comes out to be, and you don't get much for it. When you talk about $2.6 billion for a runway, for something that's only going to give a limited increase in capacity, financially it doesn't make any sense. It has significant capacity. It would allow us to handle 632,000 operations in the year 2015 compared to the 514 today. It will take us from 40 to 65 million people. Anybody who can count knows that's a significant increase in capacity. There is one test that would resolve the disagreements. It's called a real-time study. Air traffic controllers and pilots would actually simulate the takeoffs and landings that would occur with the new airport configuration. In fact, in this July 13, 1998 memo, FAA officials called for a real-time study, quote, at the earliest convenience. We had been working hand in glove with people in flight safety and other divisions at the FAA for this real-time study. It was sound. And I was more than willing to, to, to vet my reputation on the fact that a real-time study would prove that W1W is not worth the money. If the real-time simulation does prove us wrong, we're gonna withdraw our opposition. We'll get behind W1W and we'll push it. On July 23rd, 1998, 10 days after that FAA memo calling for a real-time study, Missouri Congressman and House Minority Leader at the time, Dick Gephardt, held a closed door meeting with FAA Administrator Jane Garvey, as well as a delegation from St. Louis to lobby for W1W. This was clearly an arm twisting meeting. The supporters told Garvey they believe W1W has been studied enough and they want quick approval. City and Lambert officials talked for an hour to the FAA Administrator and tried to alleviate her concerns of three safety issues. And the FAA at Congressman Gephardt's office saw only a one-sided proposal. No opponents were invited to today's meeting. And Dick Gephardt told us just the other day, Jeff, that uh, a decision is needed very quickly on this. He says if a decision is not made by the end of July, then federal money cannot be released for this and, uh, throughout the year. And on July 31st, 1998, Garvey wrote a letter to Gephardt, paving the way for W1W. It's being approved, W1W is gonna go forward and that's good news. It looks like it will happen. The Federal Aviation Administration gives the go-ahead to expand Lambert Airport. This is more than just a runway, this is a $2.6 billion program that will give this area a brand new runway, will solve the capacity problem at Lambert. You are going to destroy the city with W1W. In the letter, Garvey told Gephardt that the FAA was satisfied with all remaining safety concerns. Garvey also said the FAA will not be proceeding with a real-time simulation because they were satisfied that the procedures of W1W were safe and a real-time study wasn't necessary. Gephardt told the pilots, well, why is this, why are you doing this, the 11th hour? Not the 11th hour. They said that all along and were ignored. I was pretty confident that if they, they took us up on that, that the W1W would die its natural, well-deserved death, uh, but they didn't. Two months after the Garvey letter, the FAA gave a favorable record of decision and its final approval for W1W. After the record of decision, there was still a push from Tom Brown and the Pilots Association for a real-time simulation, and Bridgeton and St. Charles even offered to pay the $60,000 for the three-month study, but the FAA wouldn't accept it. Madam, it is not my choice to do a real-time study. It's the FAA's, and as far as I'm concerned, it would be a worthless expenditure of effort and money. That ends the interview. Thank you. I think he was wrong. No, I think he was. I think he was wrong. I think he was. He maybe he knew, understood, understood that the real-time study would prove that W1W wasn't wasn't worth the money. We were hoping that the science would win over the the politics, uh, but then. Uh, as it turned out, it didn't. Griggs felt like the pilots and the air traffic controllers 
should be able to make anything work. And if politically that was the best um, plan, then well, you guys, you just make this plan work. It was a political solution. It was a political solution. It was a political choice. And you look at the structure, the airport governors, what else could happen? It was really decided on the basis of politics. Bridgeton took the decision to court, but ran out of legal challenges by April 7th, 2000. It was a narrow decision. The U.S. Court of Appeals voting two to one, upholding the Federal Aviation Administration's review of the $2.6 billion expansion of Lambert Field. If people uh, look at the dissenting decision, they'll see what is really relevant. And I find that his findings were spot on with everything that we were saying. They had a three-tier review when they looked at the plans. Any 1A was thrown out on the very first tier, so it never got consideration further down the line. And the judge's point was, he felt they were at fault by throwing it out in that first tier review rather than going down to actually assessing the environmental impact and weighing that against the cost. And if they had considered any 1A at that stage, I think it would have won out over W1W. With politics winning over science, it looked like Leonard Griggs and the city of St. Louis were on the cusp of creating what they thought would be a world-class airport for the region. However, there were forces brewing for some time in the airline industry that Lambert officials in the city of St. Louis should have seen coming, something that was essential to the full $2.6 billion W1W expansion plan. Leaders, to some extent voters and the press, were going like, well, gee, it can't be as bad as talent saying it is, because they wouldn't do anything that dumb. And yet my experience, I've been around government for a long time, and yes, it is possible. There also has to be a dose of honesty so that we don't uh, leave some white elephant to our grandchildren here, um, and, and having told them that this was going to be uh, some great world-class facility, uh, and having spent all this money to find out uh, that it really wasn't. The future of St. Louis looks good, and I think the future of Lambert Airport looks even better. I'm very pleased that in 10 years, I want to eat my words wherever I may be. Anytime you do something like this, there is a risk. I think we have minimized the risk. I think we'll take the prudent steps to make sure the city or somebody else is not going to eat this thing, and I don't think it'll be known as Greg's folly. Buyouts in Bridgeton began immediately after the record of decision, and the first home to come down in Carrollton after W1W approval was at 4409 Brantwood in October 1999. It's a very sad day for this family, and it was very hard for me to watch it. Even though the houses are starting to go down in our community, we believe absolutely that W1W will never be built. I'm very sorry for the buyout. It had to be done. We try to do it as equitably, as honorably, and as fairly as we know how to do it. We're tired of seeing their faces, saying how fair they're going to be. It's not fair. If we do fight them, they put us on a shelf and uh, come back six months later and say, okay, this is what we offer you. Either take it or we're going to tear your house down anyway. The people of Bridgeton should just pack up their lawn chairs and move. And that was Colonel Griggs's mode of operation, and it was his reputation all the way up and down the, the agency. I mean, it was more fear-based than respect-based. People building community, one of our taglines was, there's some things that money can't buy. Meaning, d don't pretend by throwing money at a, at a community that you're making them whole. I think that the airport focused so much on stats. Stats are not human. Just because we're giving money for your private property doesn't necessarily mean that this is going to be a fair thing or a right thing. If we continue to proceed down this path, the city of San Luis will become a laughing stock of airports, a laughing stock. W1W is ludicrous. I think the future of St. Louis looks good, and I think the future of Lambert Airport looks even better. I, I'm very, I'm very pleased that in 10 years you won't have to eat say that and I want to eat my words wherever I may be. Our top story, many in St. Louis are optimistic about the reported buyout of Transworld Airlines. 
Transworld Airlines, TWA, that name ceases to exist. Get out the spray cans. American Airlines reportedly will buy out the financially troubled St. Louis-based carrier. St. Louis has to look at this as being better than a poke in the eye with a sharp stick. January 10th, 2001 marked the end of a historic era in St. Louis aviation. American Airlines bought TWA after the airline had served the region for more than 70 years. The whole purpose of Lambert expansion was to keep a major hub in St. Louis and create a world-class airport for the region. Based on TWA's financial outlook and trends in the airline industry, should St. Louis and Lambert leaders have seen this coming? After TWA made Lambert its primary domestic hub in 1982, terminal expansion brought capacity to 81 gates by 1985. In the same year, TWA began non-stop international flights, and then one year later, TWA acquired Ozark Airlines, giving the merged carriers control of more than 80% of the traffic at Lambert. But that's when the trouble started for TWA. TWA had been a very strong airline coming into this situation until Carl Icahn took over the company. Basically, what he did was take all the cash out of the company and replace it with debt, thus putting it in a very weak position, unable to go through an economic downturn or any kind of shock to the system. They take on a lot of debt during the good times. They spend like drunken sailors. When the bad times hit, they have to pay back the debt. They go under. Flying point to point was starting to dilute the, the, the need to have a hub and spoke system. So that trend was already started. The city of St. Louis was definitely making a high risk decision on betting that much money on TWA. TWA hadn't made a profit since 1988 and its stock price collapsed from more than $20 a share in 1996 to $1.32 a share when they sold to American. Questions about the airline's role in expansion began as early as 1990 when Jack Beekner raised concerns about Lambert's passenger traffic projections to justify expansion. We will closely monitor the progress of the aviation industry and the nation's economy to ensure financial soundness of our expansion program prior to commencing construction. TWA filed for bankruptcy in 1992, and then in 1993, the city of St. Louis bailed TWA out of bankruptcy with a $70 million purchase of the airline's leasehold interest and improvements, and also personal property at Lambert. TWA filed for bankruptcy again in 1995, just one week before W1W was announced. The third and final bankruptcy in 2001 led to the sale to American Airlines. I did have a concern that if TWA went under and we could not replace it with another hub, that our, our projections regarding uh, the needed capacity would turn out to be all wrong. So again, doing something that was substantial but more modest made more sense. In 1997, one year before W1W was officially approved, Bridgeton hired Scott Terry to do an independent study to see if W1W made sense for Lambert, TWA, and the St. Louis region. I didn't get involved in this to sort of uh, champion Bridgeton's case. But what we had talked about was looking at how did this particular expansion plan fit with the needs of the airport and the community and the airline. I, I think I've sort of somewhat infamously said that they, St. Louis bet on the wrong horse with TWA. Our top story, a report issued today questions whether Lambert Airport will be able to pay for the W1W expansion plan. The airport's plans for the West 1 West expansion are bigger than the city's wallet. The study's major finding is that revenue estimates are based on erroneous information or overly optimistic accounts of the environment in, with, in which the airport and its main tenant, Transworld Airlines, currently operate. Scott Terry thinks improving Lambert Airport to save its primary carrier could backfire, creating more problems for TWA than it actually solves. Landing fees at Lambert are expected to double, leaving some question as to whether TWA can afford it. I think the worst case scenario is you go ahead and you spend a bunch of money and you fail, uh, then the city, then the region is not well served in either case. The cost associated with the expansion was going to be borne primarily by TWA at a time when it couldn't afford the low, relatively low cost that it was paying already at St. Louis. We were kind of joined at the hip with, with uh, St. Louis and Lambert Field. I know a lot of the people in TWA were quietly skeptical of all the plans. They were pretty much obligated to go along with whatever St. Louis wanted. Another factor for TWA was the terminal in the $2.6 billion W1W expansion plan. But Lambert expansion was a catch-22 for TWA. The financially troubled TWA cannot afford to pay for a central part of the overall expansion, a new terminal. And without that terminal, TWA says it's not sure how it's going to pay for W1W. Underwriters have told the city 
TWA can't afford a new terminal. Without new ways of generating revenue, TWA isn't sure how it will pay for W1W. Yet even now, the city is moving ahead with phase one. Exactly, and of course that could be the Achilles heel for the whole thing, that they can't pay for it. TWA CEO Bill Compton told members of the Regional Commerce and Growth Association that without a new midfield terminal, W1W does the airline no good. What he is saying is an absolute given for TWA to realize the full benefit of the runway expansion, they have to have a terminal that can accommodate that. And the issue is not whether that's going to happen, the issue is the precise time sequencing. The fact that TWA says we're more concerned about the new gates, new terminal, when what I hear happening, especially from the interview with Mr. Griggs the other day, W1W is about the third runway, a billion dollar project. There's no $2.6 billion W1W expansion plan. The stuff about the terminals isn't set in stone. So now if you've got TWA saying we're not worried about the runway, we want the terminals, I think something's falling apart here. I'd and as usual, the people who live here will be the last to know about it. So what did the American takeover of TWA ultimately mean for W1W? Some of the most powerful leaders who pushed the deal through in 1998 were now doubling down on the expansion plan. We could actually, because of uh, they're seeing value in an expanded Lambert. We could accelerate the time frame for a new midfield terminal, which was going to be a challenge with TWA's financial straits. It's a billion plus dollar investment, but it's something that overnight could turn St. Louis into the Atlanta of the Midwest. They're gonna need a new terminal and the new runway. So I think it, it adds emphasis and need for the expansion of Lambert. W1W expansion is to be paid in large part by facility taxes on TWA passengers. Anything less than a hub airline like TWA won't pay the bills. If there is not another airline, that's correct, W1W does not get paid for, and St. Louis will be relegated, I think, for the indefinite future as, as a second-class city. American Airlines reportedly would use St. Louis as its third Midwestern hub, in addition to Dallas and Chicago. Don't expect this to be any kind of a major hub. When American came in, they announced a new American Airlines here in St. Louis was going to become the third hub. In other words, we we're going to have a backbone, Chicago, St. Louis, and Dallas. It's almost laughable when you think about it. That's called a backbone. You don't need a backbone for air traffic going throughout the United States. I have said from the outset, W1W will never be completed. And the only change now is that I think some people will agree with me. The city of St. Louis and Lambert did not agree with Conrad Bowers and pressed on with the W1W expansion plan and broke ground on the new runway on July 30th, 2001. Expanding and modernizing Lambert International Airport is one of the most important things we can do to ensure our economic future. This new runway is going to give us the wherewithal to follow through on our commitment to grow and develop our new hub for many, many years to come. The terrorist attacks on September 11, 2001 threw the airline industry into chaos, with air traffic decreasing nationwide. But business moves by American Airlines during this time frame showed how much, or how little, they valued Lambert in St. Louis, raising the question again of whether or not to follow through on the W1W expansion project. American will spend less than $15 million for airport improvements, a far cry from other American Airlines cities these are not serious renovations. Uh, this is not the second terminal or the new terminal that they've been talking about. A new terminal is even more of a dream in St. Louis now, where American so-called improvements include replacing large passenger jets with smaller regional jets on the D concourse. There's no need to expand unless you have clear indication of where the growth of the industry is going and that has been totally scotched. I still have serious doubts where it'll ever be completed because of financial considerations and what's going on in today's world makes that even uh, more meaningful than, it, uh, than I, when I made the original statement years ago. But the airport director says all the bonds needed to build the runway are already sold and that potential slowdowns in the air travel industry were factored into the cost of the expansion plan. Do you think Lambert still needs to go forward with airport expansion considering all the trouble in the airline industry? If I did not think it, we would not be going forward. 
anybody who objects to it, I think, has a head in the sand. Moody's believes that St. Louis is particularly vulnerable to declines in airline operations and passenger emplanements in the current environment, given its role as a connecting hub for American Airlines. And the role St. Louis and Lambert would play for American Airlines would become drastically different on July 16th, 2003. Obviously, the news from American Airlines is not good. American is cutting the St. Louis hub by half, offering about 200 daily flights, mostly on smaller regional jets and propeller planes. Today, American Airlines announced it will strengthen its hubs in Chicago and Dallas-Fort Worth, but it's punching St. Louis in the gut. I don't know if this is the end of it for the city of St. Louis. What about the expansion of Lambert Airport? As far as that will continue. We'll take whatever steps we have to do. As of right now, we have the projected revenue, and I'd rather not make any comment on that. With the exception, this is the absolute essentiality for being able to track carriers. Is there no end of climate that still sense? makes sense? Of course it makes sense. You know, you build an airport for the future. You don't build for today. You know, and this is what WNW is all about, is building for the future. If we're going to put all of this time and money, let's not be creating a white elephant that we're embarrassed by at the end of the day. And all the signs were there that they had really backed a loser, a real boondoggle, and they couldn't admit it. The numbers show the American cutbacks of 2003 was an even more devastating hit than the buyout of TWA in September 11th, both in terms of passenger traffic and aircraft operations. While other airports recovered and prospered after 9-11, Lambert left itself behind. There wasn't enough of a recognition of the economics of what was going on in the airline industry. It's a very cyclical industry. So what we're looking at right now is ignoring the nature of the industry as if we were always going to continue to expand. The handwriting was on the wall even before this whole situation got started. If you were simply looking at the economics and what was going on, it didn't take a rocket scientist to figure this out. The W1W runway, known as Runway 1129, finally opened on April 13, 2006, but with little fanfare. Leonard Griggs retired as Lambert's airport director even before the new runway became operational. And after nearly two decades of pushing stories and editorials favoring airport expansion into Bridgeton, the St. Louis Post-Dispatch finally questioned the necessity of this project. Post-Dispatch did fall down on their job. That was my regret about the, the media coverage, not that we weren't able to generate it, but that so often it was trivialized. The Post-Dispatch, we used to call it the Post-Disgrace. On this issue, they, they didn't serve the region. The benefit of hindsight also came from local St. Louis leaders after the runway became operational. In 2007, Mayor Slate made the statement that St. Louis missed a real opportunity in 1970 by not moving Lambert to Columbia Waterloo. If they would have had the airport in that area, then you wouldn't have had the migration to the west. Mayor Vince Shamel echoed those statements about not building the Illinois airport in a 2019 interview. But as mayor in 1989, he wrote that expanding Lambert was better than building a new airport. If you really wanted a world-class airport, if that was the real goal, can't happen at Lambert. I think a lot of people today will look at W&W &W and say, well, it would have been okay if TWA hadn't failed. And I'll challenge that in a heartbeat. It was always a bad deal. It remains a bad deal. It wasn't worth the, the money. It wasn't worth the anguish they inflicted on the city and residents of Bridgeton. St. Louis believed that this was the only way to retain St. Louis as a significant player in the U.S. market. They were doing this in part in a field of dreams sort of way. If we build it, they will come. I think that myth, if you will, really played in a lot to the politics of what was going on at the time. In September 2009, American Airlines announced it was officially ending its hub operation in St. Louis, cutting down its number of daily flights from 200 to 36 to just nine cities. Lambert's annual passenger traffic fell below 13 million people, and annual aircraft operations tanked to under 200,000 operations per year. St. Louis, its origin and destination traffic was smaller. Right. So that huge volume of passengers that was coming through the airport, nobody was getting out of the airport and going into town. They were just changing planes. You start to pull that out and all of a sudden the bottom drops out. The year 2009 also marked an infamous milestone in Carrollton. 1989 uh, was when they announced that the airport was going to be expanding. And then uh, 2009 was the year that the last house was torn down, 20 years. You were in this holding pattern for 20 years, and that's a long time to not know what your future is. And 10 years after the last house was torn down, 
This is Carrollton today. This right here is home sweet home. Completely different. Certainly didn't look like a forest. Um, it was obviously had rows and rows of houses, sidewalks that you could see. Um, so yeah, I mean, it looked like an everyday suburb. It doesn't look like that now when you have trees growing through the middle of the road. The whole neighborhood was wiped out. So it was very depressing that they did nothing with that property whatsoever and it's all gone. And for what? For nothing, except for the pool. The Carrollton Pool Building is still sitting there and I have no idea why. That's even more depressing. As far as what's left, obviously you see that there is really nothing. And this isn't St. Louis County. This is actually St. Louis City property that is nested here. How is this land going to be utilized? Who's going to utilize it? Obviously the land is owned by the airport, but as you can see, the airport isn't doing anything. I didn't think that this would be hard. And for what, you know, for what? I think that's actually a surprise because we sort of thought the city, uh, cash strapped, was gobbling up the county to be able to do a lot of good commercial development with it and have some some resources. And it's, it's like, not only is the runway a bust, all of their land acquisition was a bust. I try to drive through Carrollton just to see what's going on. Obviously there's nothing. And this is an area where a lot of people came from. And so I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one that comes back here. I'm not the only one that sort of checks things out. And there's a lot of people that want to know what's next, what's going to happen um, what's, with what's remaining. And, you know, I think for the time being, it's going to look like this with bigger trees. When you ignore democracy, when you have something that uh, one community is able to steamroll another, that people have no voice, no representative democracy, bad decisions are made, and people get hurt. And so I think that decision does point to the need for some kind of regional cooperation, some kind of understanding of how are we going to work together. Despite losing a third of its population and more than half of the city's housing stock to Lambert expansion, Bridgeton has rebounded into an attractive and desirable city in the St. Louis region. Bridgeton's a great community and uh, we have bounced back and I'll be said like it's living in a small town but yet having all the advantages of a metropolitan area. Bridgeton has always been an open community, one that participated in the operation of the city, has numerous boards and commissions that residents serve on. It gives everybody a sense of pride. Check out the July 4th parade. I think it grows every year rather than getting smaller. The city is very resilient and that's thanks to the residents. I indicated to my wife that you could pick out any house you want as long as it's in Bridgeton we're going to stay. Lambert is no longer landlocked. However, the reason why Carrollton still looks the way it does today is a direct result of W1W at Lambert. The city owns a thousand acres of vacant land around Lambert, most of that coming from Carrollton, but can't do anything with the land because it's so stricken with debt. Lambert became a less competitive airport. Lambert was one of the most reasonable airports in terms of operations for airlines until W1W happened. But now what we have is a regional airport with a lot of debt. The city of St. Louis is crippled with debt, owing about $600 million on the bonds that paid for W1W. That means if every passenger spends $20 at Lambert prior to their departure, $5 pays airport employees, $5 pay the bills, but $9 goes towards debt payments, meaning $1 goes back to the city of St. Louis. Debt is usually the first thing that does kill you. You know, you can make a lot of mistakes, but if you've got debt, you're going to drown in it. Another way to look at it is through debt service or by adding the principal and interest on the outstanding bonds. Lambert has the infrastructure of a large hub airport, but the traffic of a medium-sized airport. Lambert's debt service per employment is higher than even the average large hub airport, and its yearly annual debt service is one of the biggest of any medium-sized airport in the country. And as of June 2018, Lambert's debt service on the bonds that paid for W1W totaled nearly a billion dollars and won't be paid off until the year 2048. Who wants to borrow all that money? And it has to be paid back, right? The interest and the principal's gotta be paid by the airport. This was a risk that, you know, was foreseeable and did counsel against such an enormous expenditure with borrowing, unless you knew you were gonna get the capacity. Is the Bridgeton airstrip costing us any money, or we using it now? Sure, it's one of the runways we use. I mean, we. 
you know, do, would we have to use it on a daily basis? No. Could we survive with our other three one ways? Yes. Was this worth a billion dollars in wiping out half of Bridgestone? You know, as an airport director, I would tell you it is an incredible asset for us as an airport. In 2015, your runway was used just 10% of the time, and now... But it's still just used 14% of the time. That's Whereas true. compared to some of the other runways that are used 44% of the time. Right, but you're, you're looking at just a purely statistic. Southwest Air still does not use the new runway because it uses too much fuel to get over to their terminal. They've always been careful about keeping the cost down and not taking on too much debt. That is the key thing. And when you're in an industry that those are the killers, listen to the smart people. Every industry has smart people. The debt is preventing the city from significantly upgrading the airport. Capital improvements at Lambert are being deferred because the city is running out of money to do them. You don't expect to get drenched inside the airport. The water came pouring through the ceiling at Lambert. In a recent traveler satisfaction survey, Lambert still sits above the average category. The survey measured customer satisfaction in accessibility, security checks, baggage claim, passenger check-in, and food and retail. What started out as a $2.6 billion Lambert expansion project turned out to be a billion dollar boondoggle in the form of a two mile long slab of concrete at the expense of Bridgeton, demolishing more than 2,000 homes four schools, six churches, 75 businesses, displacing more than 6,000 people for what was supposed to be a world-class airport for the St. Louis region. It isn't the world-class airport they thought they were always going to build. There were a lot of mistakes made. I think that it was too political rather than based on facts is what really drove us to where we are. Eminent domain you shouldn't use if, if it's not for the public good. This isn't just bad for Bridgeton. This is bad for the region if we're going to create a white elephant. St. Louis is St. Louis, and St. Louis County is St. Louis County, and never the twain shall meet. And, and trying to exercise power one over the other is not good economics and not good policy. St. Louis lost their hub carrier, and now they have an extraordinary amount of concrete that's never used. The W1W is not the plan. The plan is presented, included this mid airport terminal. So the plan was not completed, and so we have the runway. And again, a runway, you know, doesn't make a world-class airport out of any airport. But now what we have is a regional airport with a lot of debt. When you just do the airfield, it doesn't resolve the terminal problems. We see that large par par portions of uh, the old terminal that used to be, you know, wingtip to wingtip, all the way across, uh, they're abandoned. The idea of building a bigger airport with a big, long 9,000 foot runway that goes to nowhere might satisfy somebody's claim to build a world-class airport, but from a passenger standpoint or from a pilot standpoint or an air traffic controller standpoint, it did not. Was it worth the billion dollars? Not this boondoggle. There is a risk, but I think we have minimized the risk. I think we'll take the prudent steps to make sure the city of somebody else is not going to eat this thing, and I don't think it'll be known as Greg's Folly. It will allow us to handle 632,000 operations in the year 2015. It will take us from 40 to 65 million people. Anybody who can count knows that's a significant increase in capacity. Lambert's growth remains stagnant today, unable to get back to 200,000 yearly aircraft operations since American pulled its hub in St. Louis in 2009 and a far cry from Leonard Griggs' projections. Annual passenger traffic is sluggishly hanging around the 15 million mark, half of the 30 million people Lambert served in its heyday in 2000, and just a mere third of the city's initial expansion projections. Lambert isn't growing its way out of debt. All of our growth, all but about 1%, came from connecting traffic. And the city's inability to realize it couldn't get a mortgage beyond its income is handcuffing Lambert from doing anything world-class today. With the city $600 million in debt and a thousand acres of Carrollton just sitting and rotting away in what is now the property of a lethargic Lambert airport, there's a need for something new for the St. Louis region. And I've gotten a little perspective on it now after 20 years. When you get to something like this, okay, and you, you're looking at, you're searching for a rationale. What reason, whether good or bad, honest or dishonest, what rational reason could there be for something like this? So you start speculating. Uh, over the years I have found though that um, incompetence can explain a lot. People always go back to 1877, you know, this great separation, the settlers from the county, and I think the Post referred to it as the dumbest political mistake ever made by the city. 
Well, I would say W1W, the selection of W1W, is a second uh, dumbest political mistake. Lambert still is going to try to figure out what the future of this area is going to be. So long as the residents are still alive, they're going to be talking about it. What's going to happen when my generation is gone and the next generation has this runway, what are they going to do with it? The story's not over. It's not ended yet.